Welcome to Australian Taekwondo Talk, where we meet the people who make our martial art great. Brought to you by Ageless Taekwondo, part of the Move It Oz initiative, a modified program for over 65s that's accessible, affordable, and implemented in a community setting. Stay tuned to find out how you or a loved one can get involved. Have you ever stopped to consider what is actually going through your mind in the middle of a sparring session? Or when learning a new Taekwondo move? I'm willing to bet that you aren't thinking about what you need to put on your grocery list or thinking about how embarrassed you are about that thing that you said in that important meeting last Thursday. You're laser focused and very present on the mat. And if you're not, you might soon wish that you were. Dr. Luke Del Vecchio is a lecturer practitioner in sport and exercise science at the School of Health and Human Sciences at Southern Cross University. And he's a whole lot more than that as well. His expertise has been used in the formation of the Ageless Taekwondo program, and he's been looking at mindfulness in combat sports and involved in a range of research into what things like Taekwondo do to and for the mind and body. Welcome to Australian Taekwondo Talk, Dr. Luke. Thank you for having me on. Pop quiz, do you know how many letters there are after your name? No, it's not something I routinely do. So <laughs> maybe you can inform me and then we both will know. I can inform you. I have counted them and it's 16. There but that go. counts numbers as well. There's a couple of numbers in there as well as letters. I only ask that because I'm really interested in the idea of combat sports at some level are very primal and very fundamental, and yet you have spent a lifetime studying them at the highest level. Why? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Aaron, and it's uh, something I have been asked before, and I, I guess I started out, out as a martial artist well before I went on to pursue uh, sports science, and I'm a sports scientist, so mm. I consider and always say that I'm a martial artist first and foremost. How did you discover martial arts? For me, like probably a lot of people, it came through watching a Bruce Lee movie. Um, ah, do, do you know you are the third person who has said that in three weeks? Yeah, yeah, I, and, and it's true. I, I think it was the big boss, if I recall correctly, watching that <laughs> and just being mesmerised by what Bruce Lee was doing on the screen and just wanting to, to emulate what he, he could do on the screen was really a big part of my motivation to get into martial arts, and, and that's what I did. I started to look for and have my parents drive me around to a variety of different martial arts clubs and I tried a range of them and eventually I settled in on Kung Fu and of course I was doing a little bit of Taekwondo on the side as well and cross training a lot in the different martial artists as Bruce Lee always said was a good thing to do to try and explore all the different arts and I did that for the best part of my life up until this point in time. Without psychoanalyzing too early in the conversation what is it that appealed to you and I'm particularly interested in the idea of the big boss were you especially small or was there some sense that you wanted to uh, be more empowered than you were I, I, I think the latter definitely the be a bit more empowered and, and I guess always mindful of the need to be able to defend yourself as well and, and from a young age you know everyone experiences some form of conflict in the schoolyard and um, I'm no different and I'm sure it was one or two of those experiences as well that that shaped my motivation to want to make sure that I could always defend myself. A lot of people go on that journey. A lot of people tread the path to this point, but what made you want to then peek behind the curtain, understand what was going on when you were involved in combat sports or martial arts? I think a big part of it, it's just that emotional self-regulation and even at a young age you mightn't understand it as being emotional self-regulation but I guess being able to control yourself in in a stressful situation is something that we're all intuitively aware of and how quickly we learn that when we're, we're pressured or stressed um, how easily things can fall apart and I guess when I talk about things that fall apart I'm referring to our ability just to maintain a certain level of self-control I think that really is something that's quite intuitive to us all as well we all like to feel in control and I'm sure psychological theories would support that as well. That uh, Having a level of control or having perceived control is very important to, to wellness and happiness as well. And it is at the heart of a lot of the philosophy behind multiple martial arts. 
Indeed, indeed, and that's central. That's a core core element to to the martial arts, isn't it? That uh, the pursuit of self control, pursuit of emotional regulation, albeit through a physical means, I think really is part of the appeal of martial arts and something I hope doesn't get lost. You know, you can see with the commercialism of all martial arts entities that there there is an unfortunate move away from some of these traditional elements and. I think these are the important elements that we need in this day and time where we all live such busy, busy lives and we're all under so much pressure and the world can be quite a, a disconcerting place. So it's even more so it's how important is these traditional elements of the martial arts. I feel like we'll revisit a number of the themes you've just touched on there, but let's move to mindfulness. I think generally mindfulness is becoming better known and better understood in broader society. But I also think that in that understanding, many people's minds immediately go to meditation or yoga or those sorts of pursuits, not sparring. So what is the interface between martial arts and mindfulness? Well, I think at its core, it's just being present. And with martial arts, you're forced to be present, albeit physically. Now, for a lot of people, and I think this includes myself, the, the concept of sitting down and actually trying to concentrate on a, a particular centering technique, whether you call it meditation, whether you call it mindfulness, can be difficult. Mm. But when you're put in a situation like what you described, where you're having to physically perform or you have to physically follow a series of instructions or that you're potentially in a combative situation, albeit sparring, there is no option but to be present both physically and, and I guess, mentally. And I think this strikes at the heart of where martial arts plays such a key role in facilitating and developing uh, an approach to mindfulness. Your research, as I've explored it, breaks down the process, though, into a series of stages. Could you walk us through those? Yes. I mean, certainly our, our research at the moment is more focused on the physical output, but in time, as we've learned through research like, say, on Tai Chi, which is very seminal and there is and our plethora of a resource supporting Tai Chi, not just for some physical ailments, but also for the, the mental health benefits. I think the breakdown really relates to the, that process mm. that psychologists call a bottom-to-top approach, and that is that if you can't obtain the health benefits or the mental health benefits from mindfulness practice, then there is alternate routes. And this alternate route I'm referring to is that bottom-up approach where you use physical training to train the mind. And as we say in martial arts, to train the body is to train the mind. That's quite a high concept. Practically, people might relate to this as the idea that I explored in the introduction there, that when you are preparing to engage, everything else in life melts away. Is that a real layman's description of what is going on? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I, I wouldn't say it's, I degrade that by saying it's layman. I think it's a very important way of describing the, the actual truthfulness of the event. You have to be present both physically and mentally. And, and that strikes at the heart of what mindfulness is and our understanding of mindfulness. And I think that's where martial arts and martial arts training in general play such an important role in this area. And we know that health benefits of mindfulness and it extends well into the active aging component and I guess that's the other link the other component to our research on the ageless taekwondo program it's not just the physical benefits but it's the mental health benefits as well that we really feel as though this form of exercise physical training can really have a benefit to the general population at large. What is it that you think is going on in the mind in that process is it my term, not yours, hyper-engaged learning. That is to say, I have a set of instructions or a skill that I'm trying to master and that is requiring all of my attention? Or is it more, I guess, existential than that? The idea that you're about to engage an enemy, and I put that in inverted commas, and therefore you have a, a far more survival instinct kicking in. What do you think is going on behind the eyes? Yeah, I think both could be reasonable explanations. I mean, if we look at the scenario or the context of actual combat um, and we think about the physiological response being the, the fight or flight response the key driver there is the the release of adrenaline and noradrenaline which are our fight or flight hormones and when we release adrenaline or noradrenaline um, 
we know physiologically that sharpens the focus that it it does everything it needs to do to help that 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 species or that individual um, respond in a way that ensures survival and in this case that would mean being hyper focused because if you weren't then the chances of survival would be a lot lower so we can really bring it back to a, a you know a, a real survival scenario and draw on our understanding of the fight or fight response as an example so absolutely i think that would provide almost a biological explanation of this phenomenon why does mindfulness matter well it depends what angle you're looking at i mean there's just so many good reasons to to want to look into mindfulness and we're talking about a health benefit in general we're talking about a cognitive benefit which is an area of the research that i'm undertaking that i'm particularly interested in as well Um, as i said you mean that saying i mentioned earlier to train the body is to train the mind I think mindfulness is a great example of that. Mm. The, the health benefits of mindfulness extend well beyond just being centred and emotional regulation at that time. I think it extends well into concepts like successful ageing and concepts like successful cognitive ageing as well. So I think it has greater implications well beyond the immediate effect of being calm and just reducing acute stress, for example. To break it down even further, I guess... The absence of mindfulness, and you keep using the word presence, which is a powerful word, the absence of mindfulness is either being unduly focused on the past or unduly focused on the future and not present in the present. Am I understanding it right? I think that's an excellent an excellent description. And I think really when you consider the practical application of what's happening in a martial arts training session, there really is very little option to be distracted. And you're not watching your instructor if you are emulating a particular mm. technique or as you alluded to, if you're sparring with another person in in that setting, uh, the moment you are distracted with a, a thought from the past, there's going to be a breakdown in your technique or you're going to suffer, I think. And as you say, combat sports seem to me to bring a more flicking a light switch approach to that than the gradual turning on of the lights that one might achieve through a meditation or a yoga approach, which is not to say one is better than the other, but clearly one is going to work better for some people than others. Absolutely. It's like we all have different styles of learning, don't we? Some are more visual, some are more kidding, Mm. some are more auditory based. This is no different. I mean, there's many paths to the top of the mountain. And indeed, as I described, and this was a conversation, an organic conversation I had with a psychologist who was working with me at the time. And the context was we were working with a group of military veterans and we were using martial arts to help these military veterans control and regulate their emotions. Um, And what we were finding was that the conventional exercise really wasn't having the desired effect. So um, it was that point where we, I, you know, I discussed the concept of using martial arts training instead just to see how that would work in terms of engaging them but also keeping them present and potentially then the flow-on effect could be therapeutic in terms of reduced severity of their PTSD. And it was that conversation that led to the description of the, the bottom-up and the top-down approach that psychologists typically use. And they agreed that these were the, the type of individuals who weren't responding well to cognitive behavioural therapy, which if I draw an analogy is the same as somebody who sits down and tries to meditate or tries to practice mindfulness unsuccessfully for whatever reason that just doesn't seem to get them in the so-called zone. So then you have a situation where you use a physical activity, but that physical activity has to be engaging to the point where it does allow the individual to become hyper-focused. And the only reason it allows them to be hyper-focused is because they're pursuing the skill acquisition element. So not every physical activity has that skill acquisition element. And I guess an easy way to explain that or to draw an example would be to think about walking on a treadmill. So once you pretty much get on the treadmill and you work out where the stop button is and work out where the start button is, there isn't much else to do in terms of developing the skill. So very quickly you could start to find that the individual wouldn't be as present because they're not really required to be concentrating on what it is they're doing. Whereas when you put them in a situation where they're learning a new martial arts technique, Um, that does require a much higher level of skill acquisition and that does then draw on the need to be much more present, a.k.a. mindful. 
I think that's a really powerful example because a lot of people listening can relate to that idea of being on a treadmill and you are thinking about your grocery list or you are thinking about that awkward thing you said to that girl 25 years ago. And that just doesn't happen when you are in a more taekwondo setting. Exactly right. Exactly right. Because there's a multitude of skills that you're trying to perform and in a lot of ways, you're forcing the hand of that individual to concentrate and be present because they're just, they're obviously not going to follow the, the, the lead of the instructor at the time. And if, and then ultimately, all of us intuitively want to, to improve our skills. We've all got that inner desire to want to achieve. And if anything, perfect the, the technique that we're trying to develop. It's quite intuitive for a lot of people. So I think it's that motivation, it's that internal incentive that drives the presentness of the, the state of mind. And that is to to, be ins- to ensure that you're concentrating on what you're doing, you're following instructions, because the output, the desired intent and the goal is to actually perfect the technique. And that's how we elicit the mindfulness. And that's why martial arts are so unique, as opposed to a lot of other physical activities and exercise. We talk here on Australian Taekwondo Talk about schools programs, uh, how, for example, martial arts and Taekwondo in particular can help with issues like bullying. We are sponsored by the Ageless Taekwondo program because clearly there are benefits to combat the effects of aging. What in your research have you learned about what Taekwondo in particular, martial arts more generally, combat sports, bring to different demographics at different points in life? Yeah, I mean, I I draw on some wonderful examples of some research that looked at the use of this case, it was boxing in troubled youth, New South Wales, South Coast, now, if I recall correctly, Mm. and they had a group of troubled youth undergo a a six or a 12-week boxing program, and the intent was to see if boxing could be used to help regulate their emotional control because they were troubled youth and obviously group of individuals or younger individuals who had trouble emote, you know, emote with emotional regulation. And at the completion of that trial, as a pilot study, they did observe significant improvements in a number of markers of emotional control. And that was just a boxing program. So, and there's been other work done um, in other types of combat sports, again, in similar demographics with troubled youth. And I guess what we're really seeing is that relationship between an activity that not just engages the individual, gives them a, a focus point but provides them with a means of emotional expression. And that is, you know, hitting and kicking a pad, for example, can be a way that those those troubled youth can actually express their emotion in a, in a more productive, conducive and safe way or manner. How does that manifest then in something like ageless Taekwondo in a 70-year-old woman who's never been involved in combat sports? Well, they're at the opposite end of the, the life spectrum, aren't they? And it's that point in the age spectrum where... Those individuals are looking for something different. They need something different and they need the cognitive stimulus. It's about maintaining a level of activity and also keep keeping the spectrum of motor skill available. So if it is called upon in an everyday activity, like having to navigate a busy street, get across the road safely, for example, they can draw on those motor skills to potentially have to walk around a car or two, accelerate or decelerate, uh, respond to the change, the, the light going from green to red or red to green. So these are all key motor skills that we lose with age if we're sedentary and we don't literally face that scenario of use it or lose it. So it's the uniqueness of martial arts training or something like you know modified or ageless Taekwondo that incorporates a wide range of these motor skills that the older individuals can practice routinely, which can then lead to a to a benefit in terms of their ability to continue performing their daily activities that enable them to live a long and active life. And so while the motivation and even the process are quite different in different demographics, actually what is going on behind the eyes is similar in the sense that it's about learning or creating new cognitive pathways and the benefits that flow from that. That's precisely right. And and, I mean, it's a a term and a phrase that is used quite widely, and that is the neuroplasticity effect, that mm. you know, neurons that fire together 
wire together. So every time we're teaching an older adult a new Taekwondo technique, for example, we're creating new pathways in the brain. They're, they're literally going to experience an increase in brain volume because these new connections, these new neural connect connections or nerve connections physically exist and expand the volume of the brain. There's a long-established tension between the science of uh, humans and humans themselves, the society and the psychology, there's a common problem that keeps rearing its head as well, and that is the mythology that surrounds martial arts outside the community itself. Those of us inside the community are well aware of what does and does not happen, but how much do you see in your study that there are preconceived ideas or prejudices about what goes on in martial arts that are brought to bear? Yeah, that's, that's a very pertinent question. Indeed, and that's a challenge we're facing as we're trying to recruit um, some older adults to participate in our study that a lot of them have actually uh, had children who did Taekwondo and, and now of, of the opinion that it's going to be too difficult or too vigorous for them as an example. So I guess the perception of the, from the community who aren't necessarily involved in martial arts training uh, is that it it's, it's can be um, aggressive training, it can be physically um, demanding and that potentially it's only for the sort of person who has an interest in that sort of training and they're they're quite they're quite incognizant of the potential health benefits and that's because uh, I guess there is a, sm a, a gap in the research there's a gap in the public health information about the potential benefits of martial arts training and I guess the common misconception is that it, it's it's too demanding for me or it's too aggressive for me or um, there's physical contact, and these definitely are misunderstandings or misconceptions that uh, martial arts training doesn't necessarily have to be that way, or in fact it isn't. If I'm listening to this and I am an instructor or I run a club, given everything that you have studied, tell me one thing that I can take from this conversation and enact in my world that will solve some of the problems that you perceive. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's um, not an easy question, I guess, to, to answer succinctly. But I, I mean, ultimately, it's about greater public awareness of the health benefits. And I think this is what's driving me to do this research is to, to increase public awareness of the health benefits of martial arts training. So these commonly held misconceptions can be challenged. We need to challenge them and show that martial arts training can be a viable option for the improvement of health across multiple levels. And it's, it's actually a viable option for people across all ages, full age span. It's not just for young, healthy, fit individuals. The benefits can be obtained from the very young right up to the very old. But we need more research to substantiate what we know as martial artists and what we understand as the benefits and all the wonderful things that we know about martial arts. We need to put some tangible evidence behind that or scientific evidence so we can make it more known to the general public that there are these wonderful health benefits that can be obtained by pursuing training in martial arts. Let's play God for a minute. Imagine that the Prime Minister or the Health Minister comes to you and says, Luke, I have an infinite pit of money. I know you've worked in the corporate world, you've worked in Indigenous communities, you've worked lifestyle, workplace, health and fitness, youngsters, middle age, older people. I'm just going to turn the whole budget over to you fix Australia behaviourally, fix it mental health-wise, fix it physical health-wise, what would you do? Well, I mean, it's, it's a funny question because <laughs> they, these are real challenges for the government who are continually trying to solve some of these these health dilemmas. So, um, in, in a dynamic situation, there's a whole set of other circumstances that have just emerged, right? Yeah, exactly right. And realistically, I mean, I, I battle-tested the use of martial arts, and this is anecdotal, why I need the now to pursue the research to to substantiate what I've observed anecdotally for 20 years and in all of those different settings that you mentioned that I've worked in and I have been fortunate enough to work in some very diverse settings, I've used martial arts training in Indigenous communities who were extremely reluctant to start exercising. It wasn't working. I couldn't get uh, the Indigenous community members to engage in, in exercise mm. and uh, that was why I was sent out there. And so I was left with this situation, well, do I just pack up and leave? It didn't work. I I booked a hall and I offered to run a number of these group exercise classes and uh, no one was turning up. So at that point in time, I said, okay, well, I need to take um, a different tack. I went down to the local store where everyone congregates. There was an area where everyone would sit outside the local store and I had a couple of the uh, more senior Indigenous members start doing some 
modified Tai Chi with me in front of everyone in the general public. And the reason we did that was to show that there is other options. And so, sure enough, from that moment, um, and I started to offer some martial arts training, uh, I went from having no participants to two, three, four, and eventually 10, and, and, and off it went. This speaks to where martial arts can really be utilised. And if I was in that situation where I was given this unlimited pit, and I, I would see a more holistic physical activity program being offered and it would include a wide range of different activities but one would certainly be some form of martial arts training because it just seems to work and I mean I, I showed that and proved that as I said anecdotally with the work I was doing in some indigenous communities and I've had the same effect with corporates at a white collar level the most popular class that I ever ran during the week was the either the boxing or the kickboxing or the martial arts classes and it's many iterations whereas when you were offering the more traditional exercise you'd get those who were already interested in traditional exercise but I wouldn't get to the people that I was always trying to target and that they were the non-starters those people who weren't physically active and then you know they weren't likely to become physically active if I kept trying to bang on the same door which would be to run these more conventional exercise classes so you know I've seen firsthand how beneficial martial arts can be to increase people's engagement in physical activity or and certainly adherence and that's that's just as important it's all well and good to start an exercise program but if you don't stick with it then the health benefits will never be realised. I think this is where this a potential opportunity like that could be expressed, where we could see an example of a more holistic approach to, to physical activity and the uptake of physical activity. Well, we certainly don't have infinite money, but within the constraints that we have, we are tackling this problem with schools programs, with our traditional club programs, with our elite programs, and now with Ageless Taekwondo. So hopefully we can make a dint that turns up in your research somewhere further down the track. Luke, before I let you go, just one, I guess, personal question. As somebody who has had to balance a lifetime of extremely taxing mental study and the pursuit of an intellectual life, but somebody who also values physicality and really has to practice everything that he preaches. How do you go about finding the balance to stay fit, stay strong, stay mentally healthy, behaviorally in control and physically healthy? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I, and I guess that I'm lucky that I started martial arts training at such a young age and those habits were so strongly engaged, ingrained, I should say, from an early age that I always made time for my training, my martial arts training. And these days, uh, a lot of the time, I'm just doing some self-training. I mean, I do train at a club when I can. For me, I'm just lucky that those habits were ingrained at such a young age that there really isn't a challenge for me to go, right, it's time to stop what I'm doing, get off the computer and, and do a training session. And sometimes that training session will be 15 minutes, sometimes it might be 10, sometimes it'll be an hour. But what is a non-negotiable for me is that there's going to be some form of physical training every day mm. and routinely that has to involve some form of martial arts training because that's how I you know, manage my daily stresses and it's how I stay centred and it's how I do my mindfulness training and I just have that as a non-negotiable aspect of my life. So to be clear, when you wake up in the morning, you say to yourself, I'll probably have breakfast, lunch and dinner today, I will have to go to work and I will exercise every day. And that's pretty much the strength of it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a non-negotiable for me. I just, you know, I refuse to let the sun go down before some sort of physical activity has taken place. Do you feel that helps you achieve balance? It does. Yeah, without doubt. I mean, and I, and I feel I feel the immediate effect if I miss a couple of training sessions. I, I mean, I feel out of balance. I really do. I mean, if I haven't moved my body and if I haven't particularly moved it in a way that's, you know, martial arts orientated, there's, there's a real sense that something's been missed and that just accrues and it accrues and it eats away at me to the point where it's like, no, well, this, there's just really no option. There's no excuse something. I mean, that whatever I'm doing can't be that important that I can't stop for 10 or 15 minutes, 20 minutes to, to move my body and move it particularly in a way that you know reflects my martial arts training. Everybody listening to us now knows what is great about Taekwondo, but it isn't quite so easy to know why Taekwondo is great. And so we're deeply appreciative of you asking that question and providing us some answers today. Thank you very much for being a part of Australian Taekwondo Talk. Absolutely my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me and having me on to have a chat. We will have cause to talk again in the future. Dr. Luke Del Vecchio. 
Now let's learn more about Ageless Taekwondo, part of the Move It Oz initiative. This is the time each episode in Australian Taekwondo Talk when we pause to have a chat about some aspect of Ageless Taekwondo. This is this innovative program that is being rolled out across Australia and it's designed to improve the quality of life of older Australians by exposing them to a modified Taekwondo program and all of the benefits that you, if you listen to this, are no doubt already aware of. So we've walked through many aspects of the process, both as a participant and as an instructor. And today we're going to talk about hacks essentially. What have we learned about the program that we can share with you to maximize your chances of making it successful? And by we, I mean the Australian Taekwondo Participation Manager, Ben Exton, who oversees the Ageless Taekwondo program. Hi, Ben. Hi, Aaron. Obviously, there are a million X factors in all of this, the population in your town, the demographic of your town, the buzz that's generated, all of those sorts of things. But we wanted to have a look at a few of the things that we have learned about running a successful class today. So let's just walk through various considerations. Shall we start with time of day? When does Ageless Taekwondo work in terms of times for classes? Mid to late morning tends to be the best time of day. You might find some exceptions where you could do it at one or two o'clock, but you'd, the the instructor would need to assess that through their class and get some feedback. But generally with over 65s, that's the period they have the best amount of energy to give things like this. They tend not to be out the door at 5 a.m., but they tend to not be looking for exercise at 3 p.m. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and with your hormones and, and, and the exercise physiology, you tend to have a, a bit of a dip mid-afternoon, which many people would be conscious of, especially office people who are reaching for the chocolate at three in the hour. You don't have to be an older Australian to know about the nana nap that can occur just after lunch. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, mid to late morning is definitely the best time. And um, depending on what time of year and where you're doing it as well, that you know, the weather is, is probably in that mid-morning period, probably your best time as well. I know that there's a lot of discussion goes on with elite training in Taekwondo about how a session mix should look, what the duration should be, what should be devoted to what during the course of that time. Let's start with duration. But what do we know about a good length of time for an ageless Taekwondo class? Yeah, 30 to 45 minutes is is what we recommend. Anything over 45, I think you're going to start dipping into a bit of fatigue too much and just losing the quality of the session. Um, again, it's going to be dictated by your participants, So, but that's what we recommend to start with and then you can adjust up or down depending on the feedback and, and the abilities of your class. But, you know, 30 to 45 minutes is definitely optimal. That's for the actual, in inverted commas, Taekwondo aspect. There are some other aspects to a gathering that might spill longer than that. But before we get on to that, where is best? Do we just do it in our clubs and centres? Yeah, that that's one element. So what we've found and the feedback we've got is that you need to make it as easy as possible for the participants to get to. So if your club's near a lot of where they live or a nursing home or that then and they can get there that's good but we've found it's it's better and easier for them maybe if you go say say you approach a, a nursing home or, or a community group um, and they're keen to do it you go there to deliver it so you just need a hall or an outdoor area that's shaded generally say you want to approach a bowls club you could do it there so it's really about making it as easy for the participants to be consistent and coming as possible yeah and some of those larger aged care facilities are quite well set up in that regard uh, one of the other things about location and duration is this is one of the appeals for instructors particularly given that we are in some challenging economic times is it's a way to maximize the hours in a day that your club or mat is returning some money to you as well it, this is not going to map over the top of your other commitments generally is it no not at all and i and you know i th like we've alluded to before i think this is 
really important. You know, if one thing COVID has taught a lot of people is they need to diversify their income streams <laughs> and, you know, make themselves more resilient to things like this in the future because it's pretty safe to say we're going to get more hits like this moving forward like COVID. So um, if you want to diverse your income streams, this this would be another good good way to go about it. And of course, it gives you the opportunity to exploit existing infrastructure and hopefully make use of equipment and locations that you already have, rather than putting your hand in your pocket to try and create a new revenue stream. Hopefully, that has sparked an idea in one or two of you with an entrepreneurial bent. Ben, thank you so much. We have covered off on the best time of day, the best duration and the best locations for Ageless Taekwondo. That's hacked. Next episode, we will take a look at the social approach and why that is important in Ageless Taekwondo. We will get our teeth into what is the appropriate level of intensity and we'll also find out what to watch for during classes. So that is in part two of our Ageless Taekwondo taekwondo hacks and we will bring that to you next episode thank you for being with us on this episode wherever you pick us up whether it be itunes or spotify or youtube please give us a rating and a review on any of those platforms it really helps other people to find us but the best thing you can do is share this on your social media channels send an email to a friend we really do rely as you know in the taekwondo community on you spreading the word and spreading the gospel of our martial art, both to those who already love it and those who are yet to discover it in full. So please play your part. Thank you to those of you who have been doing so, so far. We have had some marvellous success. And let's hope it continues. And of course, if you haven't heard all of the episodes so far, there's quite the back catalogue being formed there now. So go back and there are some really marvellous conversations that I think you will find inspiring. But for now, for this episode of Australian Taekwondo Talk, say thank you and goodbye. For more information on how you can get involved with Ageless Taekwondo and a whole lot more, head to ostkd.com.au. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram too. Thanks for being a part of Australian Taekwondo Talk.